Hello, friends. I'm just having some technical issues. I'm just going to see if this is actually working right now. So I do apologize. We're just going to have a, a few moments of me checking on my phone to see if it's working. Countdown. No, that's the other one. Do you need us okay. to talk at this moment or are you OK? <laughs> no, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I could do a little poem for you. I could do my favourite poem. OK, go on then, please. <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, maybe Ken. No, no, me first, Grant. Then you can talk. Then the plants can do the poem as well. Okay, <laughs> a baby hen whose name was Peg said, "Mummy, can I lay an egg? I'd wish you'd show me what to do. Then I can help you with a few." Her mother smiled and shook her head. "You're far too young for that," she said. "But do the things that you've been taught, and think a nice round eggy thought, and one day it will come to pass." An egg will pop out onto the grass. Oh. Is that echo? Did that work? I think it worked. That's right. Now the house plants can talk, Grant. Yeah, now the house plants can come in whilst we work out where the link is. The bamboo plant. This is this is Vera. I've owned her for many years. Oh, She's hello, Vera. <laughs> let me say during isolation. She helped me plan the local trails. Kinda. But yeah. That's about it. There's nothing else in this room. To be honest. You could cut some of that off and rub the juice on one side of your sunburnt face, Grant. Huh? It's not my fault I went some. I think it's the direction I walk along the cliffs. I think I just always put that side of my face towards the sun. Always going east. Before I fell asleep, one or the other. <laughs> Both are perfectly possible, to be honest. <laughs> it wouldn't be the first time I've stumbled <laughs> to the side of my face. But... Oh, it might actually be the fact that there's a window to the right of me and I spend half my days just sat here. On Could the be. <laughs> I have no idea where this video is right now. This is very strange. It says that we're live, but nobody can see us. Which is a bit weird. Can they hear us? If anyone is watching us, could you please just comment on the video and hopefully that will pop up on my feed. Because at the moment I can't see anyone. Is anybody there? Just wave at me. I mean, I won't be able to see you, but uh, <laughs> give a little hand wave. Is it me I'm looking for? <laughs> I'm, in a way, I'm I'm happy that this has happened during a group live stream. Hmm. <laughs> I think I found us. Okay, I have found us. Right, for all those viewers, ah, okay. Angelina, I see you. Barbara, I see you. Okay, I think we are good. I'm just going to share this link, everybody. Sorry, one moment, please. While I share this and then we'll be able to get to it. Okay. Hello, friends. Thank you for holding. I can't even speak right now. I can't believe what just happened. Okay, I'll start again. <laughs> Hello friends, thank you for joining us for another episode of Archaeologists in Quarantine and uh, for sticking through all of us um, with my technical issues. So thank you all. Today I am joined by Citizen and we have Caroline who is project manager and we have Oliver and Grant who are lead archaeologists. So I think the first question is, what is coastal and intertidal archaeology? Grant or Oliver, one of you please, could you take uh, I'll go for it. Uh, so the actual acronym CITIZEN stands for Coastal Intertidal Zone Archaeological Network. Um, the CITIZEN programme is all about recording archaeology and working with communities in local areas uh, and getting them to record their archaeology on the foreshores and on the coastal areas before it's inevitable loss due to climate change. So that's the kind of token one. And then we're now based in six discovery programmes. So I run the South Devon Rivers Discovery Programme and Oliver runs the Mersey Island Discovery Programme. Is that anything else, Oliver? I think that's a fairly decent summary. <laughs> yeah, I, I, just in terms of where we find the archaeology, I guess. So for intertidal, it, it's between the mean low and high water line. So it's any part of the, the coastline that's exposed between the tides. And that can be all kinds of different uh, bits of foreshore, as I'm sure anyone who's been to the coast is aware. It could be mud flats, could be cliff edges, sandy beaches, shingle beaches all that kind of thing. So we work all around the coast on, on a host of different foreshores. 
and um, we can't do this without um, the project funding and support that we get from the, um, the Heritage Lottery Funds, um, also the Lloyd's Register Foundation, Historic England, um, the Crown Estates and our partners, um, Council of British Archaeology and Nautical, so uh, sorry, Nautical Archaeology Society. So um, although we are a project within uh, Museum of London Archaeology, we are also actually supported by other, a lot, lot of other external organisations as well. Brilliant. And you mentioned about how you work along the coast. Exactly how many programmes do you have at the moment? Six. That is, yeah, six. Just <laughs> 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 double checking. So um, we, we have our six. Um, technically, um, within the engagements and research family, at MOLA, there's also the Thames Discovery Project. Um, and so they they look after that section and then we do we do the rest. At the moment, our hubs, our central areas are uh, Liverpool Bay. And then on the other side in the north is Humber, the Humber side section. Uh, further down, then we go to Oliver's section, which is Mersey Island. And then a bit further down, um, we have East Kent Coast. Further along down the south coast is Solent Harbours. And then after that, at the very, the very end, we've got um, Grant down in South, beautiful, sunny, lovely yeah. South Devon Rivers, where I was at yesterday. <laughs> yeah, and they're very, they're very yeah. big. Mine, mine runs all the way from Sidmouth down to Wembury. So it's a gigantic thing. And we mainly concentrate in the South Devon Rivers around the X, the Teen and the Dart. But then we also have the Yelm, the, um, uh, the Avon and the Kingsbridge Estuary in there as well. So there's a lot to cover. And all that coastline, of course, in Devon, all the coastlines are known for shipwrecking coasts, kind of mon monastic, um, oh, there's fish hewers, huts, and all kinds of stuff on those coastlines, and they're eventually going to fall into the sea, and including the lost village, which Caroline was at yesterday. Well. Hmm. So <laughs> Sorry, Tash, I was just going to say, um, yeah, a lot of the discovery programme areas cover quite a, lot of, quite a lot of ground. I think I'm quite fortunate, I guess, and mine is quite a discrete area, which is at the mouth of the Blackwater and the Colne Estuary in Essex. Um, so I'm quite lucky. These guys do an awful lot of walking on uh, a lot of different spots around the coast, but I'm sort of almost confined to a nice little tiny island, which is it's a jolly place to be, but there's a lot of archaeology, so it's good. Yeah, you've got a very different, I've got a lot of coastlines, so there's a lot of walking on the southwest coastal paths and then suddenly coming across a submerged forest or coming across something else, which is quite nice to be honest, but it involves a lot of walking, how which many is why I'm buying it. Grant, how many kilometres is um, your area? Oh, I don't know off the top of my head, but yeah. I think it's big, 100... long rivers going in and out and in and out, yeah, and it's easy. And and it's easy because of the bridges. Miles, I'd say probably. Yeah, because of the bridges, easy, I think, to drive around it. Yeah, <laughs> to drive around it takes, yeah, just to drive around the dark takes an hour. So yeah, <laughs> yeah it's long. But it's nice, to be honest, and there's loads of archaeology in there. And then, of course, in there, because there's a kind of southwest bias to maritime and intertidal archaeology, there's a lot to build on in South Devon, whereas uh, Mersey, the Humberside, and Humber and Liverpool are kind of building from scratch, whereas mm. in the southwest we've had a bit more there's been a bit more groundwork done by Nautical Archaeology Society, Maritime Archaeology Trust and locals and uh, amateur divers and various other people in the past and the ship's project over in Plymouth. But we've got a little bit more to build off of so the area can be a little bit bigger. And although this seems quite large now, we've got large sections to work on. This is actually a more uh, condensed version of the start of Citizen. So Citizen actually started back in, what was it, 2015. And with that, um, the, the team... Um, had the entirety of the English coastline to deal with and everywhere. So it was actually really, really hard for them to get to certain places and to concentrate and do quality archaeology as well as quality engagement when you've got the entirety of the English coastline to deal with. And this is why for this section of the project, this three years, we're currently halfway through this three year program. We are just concentrating on certain hubs and we do get some areas of the community go, oh, why, why aren't you down at our place? Our place is the best place ever. It's the oldest, it's the widest, it's the largest, it's the greatest. Everybody, every single cove, inlet, estuary, next one down the line is has got the greatest, the best, uh, <laughs> the most historic thing to go and find and research. And so we had to be very strict this time. Go, no, we're going to do this zone, and we're going to concentrate on these zones for the next three years, and then we'll go to another zone, the next zone. But it, it enables us to really concentrate um, the quality archaeology and outreach effort 
rather than just scattergun and spreading ourselves far too thin, which was, it was good lesson learned from the, the last system project where they got to find these key zones. And now with these key zones, we can go forward. Well, it must be quite challenging because you're working along the coastline. So how is it in regards to health and safety, especially that you have volunteers and you're working with the tide or against the tide? How have you found that? Is it quite challenging? Oh, we've all got very different environments, so I'll, I'll let the other two talk on that one. <laughs> Thanks, um, yeah, let's go all first, because I've got the biggest levels of mud flats in terms of... Yeah, I, I, I think one of the interesting things about how I learned how to deal with that with the volunteers is we're quite fortunate on Mersey because it's quite a it's a quite tightly knit community which has been one of the really interesting points about the project and the amount that they're willing to engage with what they do and, and the amount of um, information local knowledge that they have and particularly that is about the foreshore area there which is a huge mud flat it's at least eight square kilometers on the lowest tides of exposed muds just to the south side of the island and of course, that is can be quite a dangerous place to be, and there are lots of different sort of areas where there's softer muds, harder muds, that kind of thing. So we've really basically just started um, taking, or we started earlier on taking advice from people and building up kind of a, our approach to foreshore based on local knowledge, based on local companies, businesses, oystermen, that kind of thing. So in terms of our health and safety, we've been shown really where the safe spots and the dangerous spots are, and we've been able to build up a rather a safe approach with that. So we're quite we're quite led in a lot of ways in terms of the archaeology, but also in terms of what, where, when, and how from the locals, which is kind of really what the project's about. It's about communities bringing us to places that they are noticed and, and finding interesting and that there's interesting archaeology there. Yeah, and then South Devon Rivers is very different in terms of landscape. So you've got a lot of estuaries with different creeks inside it. So they, I call them bolt holes, but basically we work with the tide. So you always want to be going out when the tide's out, going out and coming in. You never want to be caught out by the tide. And we always, I always try and plan it so you at least have a couple of escape routes because you can get caught around a headland or around a creek or something like that so we're very cautious but then I also had a my previous background was in the diving side which means that we were very keen on tides as well so I've yeah I think we and health and safety wise we always have two of us and we have this big big old bag of health and safety kit that comes with us everywhere we go and yeah we're very hot on health and safety um but yeah challenges wise it's just a lovely place to work to be honest I think people don't really appreciate the foreshores as much as they can and how much time you do have I think people panic they're going to be um, trapped out by the tide, but you have a, quite a lot of time to play with in fair, in few areas, but you just need to learn them, if that makes sense. Mm, I, mean, I don't think that, that was a very good explanation. Mm. No, no, it's true. Like, And there are so many apps. I remember when I've worked along the foreshore, you have an app or you have the timetable, the tide schedule, so you're able to yeah. kind of plan. So and you're, one of the things we have been work, doing is uh, something called the low tide trails, which are guided walks at low tide. So it'll be uh, the community arc. So there's two discovery. There's a discovery program officer and then a community arc uh, per region, essentially, uh, mm -hmm. and they run the low tide trail. So they take people out at uh, extreme low tides out onto the foreshore and explain what archaeology is coming up and what they see. I see, and they're they're very nice. It, I do one on Old Mill Creek, and that's about um, all the different types of boats, and they give you a nice slice through the dark through the history of the dark estuary. So it's quite a nice little cut through that using all the different ship all the different wrecks essentially uh, but yeah so I, I get the joy of writing off and signing and uh producing the risk assessments to do this um and you find that it's it's all the all the problems and all the risk assessment you have to do for a land site and working with the public on the, on a land site and then all the same um that you get actually working on a dive site and underwater sites. So, um, and, and Grant knows this well, that, that, that there's so much meticulous planning on what you do and pre-planning, there's very little you do on the fly. You do a lot before you go out to dive sites that um, you, you essentially bring those two lands and sea risk assessments and that's what fits into tidal. So in, in our bags, we have these big bags with uh, these big high-vis bags. And in there we've got our, everything you need plus a little bit extra and then all the stuff if you get caught out in the water as well is, is, is a lot to do but we've got it all pretty wrapped up quite nicely touching words and trying to find words right yeah. now <laughs> oh the shelves behind me there we go <laughs> but um it's something we have to take extremely seriously and um some especially now in our in our uh, 
an environment where we um if we have COVID risks and touching and, and getting contact and w- work with our, our volunteers, it's very difficult now because our sites are so dangerous if we're complacent um, that we've got to just make sure everything is covered. And as long as we are not complacent, then then we're good to go. It's, it's going to be a great and fabulous place, but we just make sure that we're, we're always on the ball. Yeah. Always, we always do a recce beforehand. So we wouldn't take volunteers to anywhere we've never been beforehand and in the case of I used to work down in Devon so I know a lot of it personally from when I was 18 so it's quite nice. I think all of these these environments and, and the way that we have to approach them for these different reasons kind of informed a lot of the way that we do our work the way that we do intertidal surveys and uh, drones are kind of ubiquitous in, in everything really now for, uh, terrestrial as well as intertidal archaeology but they make such a huge difference for us because of course there are some areas that we can't get to for safety reasons but we can fly to them um, and that's kind of one of the really big areas that volunteers have been helping quite a lot with uh, being able to provide um, safely during quarantine when people have been allowed out of lockdown um, for, for me certainly they've been able to provide some aerial surveys of sites that we've not been able to visit um, but we can be able to keep an eye on them and they're able to update us with those so that's kind of one of the the nice upshots I guess of health and safety it identifies where you have to go and do a drone survey and not a walkover one. Yeah. It's amazing now how tech has been able to help archaeology in general um, the, the stuff that we'd always rely on you know aerial aerial footage but that costs money and I feel like now with drones we're able to get the information straight away and it's just another good thing for us in the archaeological sphere. So um, Caroline you mentioned earlier about COVID-19 how has that affected you all because your most of your work is community-based you know community archaeology or public archaeology however you you know term depending what country you're in how has that affected your your work your programs of work? Um, it's it's been a challenge cool it's been a challenge so um the biggest thing i found like about uh january february time everyone's starting to build up you know it, it's not really the time to go out on the coast so not many of the teams do that and the uh, the volunteer archaeologists have to be a hardy bunch to go out in in the january february sort of season they're usually the the, the more storm chasey type who once a storm has been through then they go out and see what's been exposed but um to really do training and to do our, our walks and so on. Um, it was all gearing up for April onwards. And so it the 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 problem with lockdown is I had a a whole team who were ready to go. They were prepared. The emails were sent out. The inf- advertising had been done. The schedules are, are, are ready to go. Uh, in, and everyone in their heads are, are ready to do stuff. And the problem is that all that stuff uh, at first, within the first week, no, actually, it's, it did change daily, actually, because we were supposed to be doing a, myself and um, Therese, our South Devon, sorry, our Stone Harbours Discovery Project Officer. We were supposed to be going out to a site and we had it all ready to go. And it was it's a big, big site. We needed about 50 people down there. And um, it was going to be the, like the second week of April. And the first time is OK, just not the volunteers we will do the staff. And then it's like, right, we can't get the staff down because all the hotels are down. So just the staff that can come in for a day and then everything. So it was it was constantly changing in those first few weeks. And that was a killer because sending a message out that was correct and succinct and wasn't going to change was completely difficult and practically impossible, actually. Um, after that, I didn't want to lose the enthusiasm of the team. And I certainly didn't want our team to get furloughed. Um, I know that other archaeological units and certainly within uh, MOLA, there are certain members of teams and and, group, and whole and whole sections that did have to be furloughed. The, the work wasn't there, it wasn't possible to do. And I thought for us, no, it is possible to do. And one of the reasons I had to do this is because I always harp on about how um, climate change and living by the coast, humans are survival, not of the fittest, but of the adaptable. We have to adapt to our changes and climate change and the, the coast and it all crumbles down into the sea. And we as good humans will have to adapt to this change and move on. And I can't then go, oh yeah, I can't, I'm not going to adapt for COVID. Yeah, we're all on furlough. We're all going to go home. So no, <laughs> I've got to now practice what I preached <laughs> and and, and made sure that we were adaptable. We had to adapt to what we did. So everybody carried on working. Nobody stopped. I don't think anyone had any holiday, nothing. 
we just <laughs> carried on. And I, I wouldn't let them have any holiday. <laughs> We'd love to go on holiday, but it seems kind of pointless. No, I had a, they a all got of whipped. <laughs> I had to carry on working. Everybody got uh, the equipment they needed. Everybody went home and we went online, essentially. And everything that we had planned to do, we had to find a digital uh, uh, or off sorry, uh, a digital alternative. And um, and actually, in some ways, this was really, really interesting. And what I'm going to find, hopefully, out of our evaluation is, especially with uh, Festival of British Archaeology. So, you know, we've got the two, the, the split, um, the split festival this year. So July turned into the digital festival and the end of October, they plan to make a Festival of British Archaeology face to face festival. So this is a great moment to actually find out how valuable digital learning and digital communications are and how what kind of new audiences we can get out to um so we've done uh webinars so instead of going to lectures and going to doing talks we, we've been delivering online webinars instead of doing our guided um low, low tide trials we've done twitter virtual low tide trails and then the self-guided low tide trials which are now on the website um instead of um you know the the activities the kids activities you might have at a table at a fair or a festival instead we have crafting with citizen so you could do that on youtube instead um and now um that's the some members of the team have really really built up on the research side and this is called now armchair archaeology so it's teaching people about you know it's, it's actually not just about the dig and the survey it's about all the research and everything else that goes with what we do and how we learn um so survival of of us as the uh, we have to survive as the adaptable as well as it's not just the, the climate change thing that i preach it's actually the work ethic that i now preach too um what will be interesting now is because we've done festival of british archaeology digital we can do the same again face to face hopefully at the end of October and we can compare the valuation of the two and see actually what, what were the advantages and what turns out better. And I certainly think that the stuff that we have done now that we've been afforded to experiment with now we can we can take forward and there, there are some things that we'll love to do again. I, it was fun doing quizzes. Um, it was fun doing webinars and it's fun doing the live bits. Um, but also there's some stuff that that was great initially, but then it was it's hard to keep going with um and people get fatigued so it's it's also watching that fatigue i've noticed on lockdown that webinars everybody's very very interested three months four months ago but as pubs open and beaches are warm and lovely that the, the webinars drop off but people are ready to go out again but hopefully we've got a nice group now of infused ready people that we've been revving up on lockdown and they're ready to go out and enjoy um our our training and everything we do out on our sites did that answer the question? I can't remember. So, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I was going to say, you mentioned the YouTube channel. So for our viewers, this is the YouTube channel. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and help community archaeology. You know, it's very important what we do. And who is this? This is Grant. That's me. Grant, so that what was, is this about? Um, that was at the beginning of lockdown. So essentially those first, and it's taken on a different it's taken on a different uh, way now. So essentially it was the South Devon Rivers video series. So I started off as just an introduction of what what we were, where, what the discovery program was, what we did. And then we moved on to a site I love because luckily I live in Totnes and I can get to the Kingswear Castle on a paddle board without anyone, without any problems, essentially without having to do that. So I went down and filmed it um, and started that. And then I offered it, I've started this idea due to isolation, because the volunteers are they're still keen and they're raring, but we can't, at the time when we were on full lockdown, you can't be encouraging anyone to go go out and break lockdown because you want to see that archaeology. So I essentially designed this idea that we'll do co uh, co uh, collaborative content generation is what I'm calling it. But essentially, it's going to be using video and using volunteers and those, because local knowledge, there's so much local knowledge in Devon. If you ever spend some time down here, they'll, take, they'll tell you tales forever. If that makes sense, so it's all about getting the picking certain sites and having our um, local volunteers record each other and then using those as a consistent video stream going on, if that makes sense, and going forwards. But we did kind of it kind of peaks and troughs, if that makes sense. We did a few videos and then we stopped for a while, and then we did a few again. Um, and then the webinars were a limited series, so we only did three. We did three for the South Devon Rivers and then three for the Southern Harbors. It is an odd experience, I don't know if you've ever. Have you done one of the webinars yet? Were you? 
you can see 150 people. Like you can't see them physically, but you see the number. And that's the bit that's quite intimidating because I've never had to, personally, I've, I've talked to conferences, but it's only ever been 20, 30 people. It's never been 150. I don't know how attentive they were. They might have just been sat there in their pajamas drinking a cup of tea. But um, it was an interesting experience doing the webinars, especially mm -hmm. the, the level of um, level of engagement, if that makes sense. The people that were actually in attendance was quite impressive, if that makes sense. Well, it's, yeah it's very weird to try and get feedback out of that. So we have an entire team of not only that they're archeologists, but they're outreachers as well. They do this outreach and engagement and they have been hired and bought in because they are face-to-face -face people that, that work off, you know, having eye contact with all with the, the people around them, your groups, your training groups. So, um, and it's, it's a wonderful sense of satisfaction. Somebody says, oh, what are you doing here? And I, I describe what I'm doing. And I, I even had that yesterday at Hall Sands where someone read the side of the car and said, oh, you do a, a beach archaeology thing. It's like, yeah, yeah, we do. What are you doing down here? And so and it's that enjoyment. And that's just one person. But to uh, do a webinar and you can see, yeah, 100 odd people watching, but you've got no idea if they're smiling, if they're interested mm -hmm. and, and taking away that, oh, that feeling, oh, I've just worked with 150 people it, online. Is, it's really hard to get that feeling that you've done a good job and it's, it's all been you get you don't get the kind of lift that sometimes you do get with that quality one-to-one -one engagement and um it's it's although it's been good i think the team can't wait to just to get out and see someone's smiley face when you tell them what this old thing is or, <laughs> or what this beach used to look like um yeah lockdown's been a good and interesting but or oh, it'll be nice to get out again yeah lovely. <laughs> oliver you're nodding your head there what have you been up to have you been doing any digital engagement well, we, we, we've actually, um, so like my colleague Danielle Newman and also Lawrence Northall, who works um, in the southeast in Kent, um, we've actually been kind of heading up a new project, which was designed really to try and perform a guess from archaeological survey of a kind whilst people are in lockdown. Um, and it's to do with trying to use uh, people's memories um, and people's personal photo collections, postcards, that kind of thing, to try and map the changes that have been taking place around the coast of Mersey since around 1920. So it's a, it's a project that um, it's a, in partnership really with the National Environment Research Council. So it's a joint project with those guys. Um, and it's it's got off to a good start. I mean, if you, uh, the slides that I sent you, Tash, if you just pop the first one up, I can just give folks an idea of the kind of scale of change that we're trying to deal with on Mersey, or not deal with, trying to understand, I suppose. Um, and it's just a simple regression map from, uh, I think, the 1920s, I think, yeah, 1923, and 2019. So the project's within this time frame. So we're looking at every 20 years from the 20s to the present. And you can just see that over the last 100 years, that the faint gray lines, they represent the low water line in 1923, um, and the black lines are the present one and you can see the the huge ray of change that's taken place on the island you're looking at kind of 100 meters for the the small island at the bottom of the screen there it's called the cob marsh um so it's a huge amount of change a huge amount of erosion that's taken place and we're trying to see if people can support us with that with any photographs and postcards and it turns out they have they've got some really quite beautifully detailed images uh, memories we're looking at oral histories so we're recording people's um experiences of the island and the archaeology that they've encountered but also other things um, sort of marine life and um, types of use for the foreshore presence absence of salt marshes that kind of thing so it, it turns out you can you can get some quite detailed information when you can't get out there and physically do the job on the ground but yeah going back to what you were saying I'm very much looking forward to getting back out there because it's a bit of a it's a bit of a magical place as Mersey we find some quite amazing archaeology i say we find it our, our volunteers really make us aware of it and then we go and, and try and record it if you if you can pop onto the next slide i can just give folks a, an idea of the type of thing that we come across um on the left hand side of the screen is a plan a survey that um, danielle and i conducted um of the site and you can see that it's made up of over 350 ginormous timber piles so this thing is a, a huge structure that's out on the foreshore and this has been washing out over the last mm, probably 15 years or so, but only recently as the, ex uh, the erosion taking place quicker, it's accelerating. 
Um, and we can see that by the condition of some of these timber piles that you can see in the photograph on the right hand side. So that's looking back up towards the beach from the, the bottom of the, uh, from the low water line. And we can see that around those stakes towards the bottom, we're getting really fresh exposures, anything up to sort of three or four centimetres, which suggests that this stuff is washing out really quite quickly. So even though this structure is absolutely enormous, it's 150 odd metres long, um, these things have lain, uh, laid there totally covered by the mud up until very, very recently. Um, in the 80s, we had the Hull Bridge survey around the Blackwater, which kind of set the baseline for the, for the archaeology that we were trying to, to compare and the change we were trying to compare. And when they conducted that survey on Mersey Island, they found only a handful of sites. And that was in the late 80s, early 90s. So since then, we've had at least five or six quite major sites pop out on the island, as well as host of other little small features here there and everywhere so it's a very interesting landscape and a really changeable one and, and that's why communities are so vital to what we do because a eight square kilometer mud flat cannot be looked at can't be surveyed by us traveling out there once every couple of weeks we're almost entirely reliant on volunteers keeping their eyes on the ground and letting us know about this stuff and the next slide or should i stop we can, yeah, I mean, that's mm. the next one is just jumping on to, again, again, talking about the, the data that our, our volunteers to collect, uh, are collecting for us. Um, this is, a, a, this is a, a mock up of something that we're changing on our website. So <clears throat> Citizen has an app where it did in the first phase of the project um, in which we asked people to use that to collect information uh, and take pictures, locations, descriptions of foreshore archaeology. And this database we had was made up of many thousands of sites featured from um, the HERs, from um, rapid coastal zone assessment surveys that have been done from the mid 90s onwards. So we had this huge data set that we were trying to update and provide uh, or, or put photographs to basically pictures so we can understand and monitor changes to those sites. Um, and that app, it worked quite well. We had, we had a few thousand people using it, but it was definitely not as good as it could have been. So we've been doing some updates to it, which we're gonna release soon, which actually just streamlines the app considerably. So it makes it a much easier thing for people to get involved in and, and for people to use. Um, but what we've tried to do with, with what you can see on the screen, we produced this, this map of all the archeology span um, and we've now been able to filter the results, filter the data that we have into a more useful um, set, of, um, set of results really that kind of support what the project is about. So along the bottom of the stream there, you can see that we can now subdivide all of our results into different periods that we gather information on. So if you were to click on uh, just Roman on that button, um, it would reveal all of the coastal archaeology that we know is of the Roman period or has been dated to the Roman period. So very quickly, and it's quite a powerful tool, hopefully you'll be able to see exactly where these hotspots of um, perhaps settlement sites, coastal industrial areas, all that kind of thing, um, where they are around the country. And crucially, their height above sea level, which is what tells us about where sea level was, um, where it has been, where it's changed. So it's, um, we're looking forward to that. It's going to be coming very soon. We're just finishing up with the last bits of testing, but hopefully that's going to be quite an exciting thing for people to use. It looks really cool. The fact that you can actually literally how many meters underwater and was it underwater, right? Yeah, so we've got height yeah. above and below sea level. Yeah, it goes down to, I think, um, minus 1.5 meters, which is quite extreme. That's the, the very lowest tide for us or a snorkel. So we'll probably not be recording too much of that. But there is information on our database that is um, located at that point. So we do need to show it. We can't exclude any of that data. But really, the, the key for us now is to continue to add that height data, the levels, basically, to the sites that we find when we can date them so we can build up this picture of change in our local areas for our discovery programs, but hopefully and wider if people use it all around the country. Yeah, that is brilliant. I don't think people understand exactly how cool that is going to be once it's in full swing. I'm actually looking forward to using it. Okay, fingers crossed. <laughs> so we'll definitely think, put the link in there. I think it was one of one of us during isolation said the world, I think it was the world may have stopped due to COVID, but the coastal erosion and climate change hasn't. That we all kind of forgot that the world felt like it had stopped in that first week of isolation where the whole world kind of just ground to a halt and no one could do it, no one was doing anything. Yeah, I think it was important. And that's kind of what the app is. The app allows anyone to say, it, people from walking their dogs to beach comas and all that, people to record and we can monitor the changes, to, um, the effect to the, to the archaeology from climate change. Mm. And yeah, it's, and the new version is really nice. That's why I'm half sunburned, by the way. I was out testing <laughs> the clips earlier. <laughs> 
<laughs> and actually, <laughs> I think that's that will be actually uh, Tash a great opportunity for a, a live stream again. We'll take you out on a walk, Lovely and you can use the app, and we can <laughs> live stream you using it. And hopefully, it'll be a smooth machine. Yeah, <laughs> really good idea. I'm up for that. Hey, I'd come and see one of you guys as well. Um, okay, you've got six places to choose from. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you take your pick. <laughs> what am I in the mood for? Hmm. Yeah, it depends. We'll see what the weather's like. I mean, you can never trust. Oh, I always try these like weather forecasts, but it never helps. Especially like working, you know, when I'm in London or something. It's just, you get all seasons in one day. Which reminds yeah, me. Hmm? I do love volunteers though, because I remember it. Some people have such... Local communities are great because even when it's tipping it down in conditions I wouldn't, in conditions you'd usually call it, if that makes sense. Volu some volunteers just love it. They're just like, no, we came to do the job. We're doing it. Even when you would personally call it, you're like, oh, this is incredible. And I think that's one of the things that's lovely about community archaeology is how strongly and how much passion there is for local communities to just to take ownership of it and get that job done and kind of understand it and record it. And uh, yeah, it's kind of a really nice thing. I did um, I yeah, notice yeah. that on one of your one of your walks, Grant. It was just before Christmas, and I honestly thought the entire population will be busy out at Christmas markets, buying presents, doing stuff, preparing things. And um, twenty people had signed up for this walk. So me and Grant are there, and it's blowing a gale. I am freezing. I'm thinking I don't want to go. I don't want to go on this walk. I don't want to be happy outreach face. <laughs> I want to be snuggled indoor face. And um, they turned up they all turned up and they Every were hardy one, yeah. and they were ready and they had their picnics ready and we picnicked on this cold december beach in a little cove and i i was so impressed that i treated them all to a mulled wine at the end <laughs> it's amazing how how hardy especially at the, a local community if they know their area they know their site they've got the right clothes for it they know what's coming um so local community volunteers but also local just local community interest is really important you don't actually physically volunteer if you're just interested and want to find out um our local communities are, are hardier and better than we give them credit for sometimes mm. they so cool. also make fantastic cakes i've discovered as well Tash. <laughs> i'm just going to give a little nod to jane dixon there if you're watching jane thank you for <laughs> well, she'll probably make you something it's now for saying a name <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's one of those things. That's why I miss out. I don't get to really engage with the public that much, especially with what's going on this whole year. We've just been, because we've been still going. So <laughs> those construction sites did not stop, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, or well, fortunately, it depends what way you look at it. To me, I kind of was wishing to be furloughed for like, you know, two months. That would have been amazing. For me, I don't know. I just like the idea of just being able to relax at home. <laughs> I would have done more. I enjoyed the challenge of moving everything over to a digital, a digi I think it was the kick that in some, I think the heritage industry work, moved so slowly that in some of these situations, it was a very unique chance to try stuff you've always wanted to, to have a go at, but you could never convince one of the big companies to go for it, if that makes sense. Something that you, you've always thought might work, like a proper YouTube channel, but you just have never been able to convince them to go let's just put a lot of effort into this. And isolation, I think, was a unique opportunity for a lot of, at least it was for me, a lot of, a unique opportunity to try loads of different digital methods to work out which ones are the most effective and which ones actually work in for what we want to do. It's true. Uh, it certainly refocused the minds. Um, mm. I know a lot of people when they started the lockdown, they, they took home tons of books and I'm going to finish this grey lit and I've got this report to do and that report. And actually... Uh, we've all found that uh, digital online engagement and uh, working with our volunteers online takes up an enormous amount of time. And all that preconceived idea of brilliant, I've got three months where I don't have to be out. I can get I can read all these books and I can get all these reports done. And actually, a quarter of that in reality got done because actually what we've been doing has taken up so much of our time, but also in a, a in a great and very positive way we've all really enjoyed experimenting and have a go and and trying to engage in a different way and trying to do archaeology in a different way so it's it's yeah it might have been detrimental to the original reading list that we all set ourselves at the beginning of lockdown but it has had its advantages and it has worked out very well talking of digital i think caroline you were on a podcast recently during digfest about um oh my goodness what was it uh, 
Yeah, yeah. So the Career in Ruins podcast, um, I did two with them. So I did a personal one of just me. And then for Festival of British Archaeology, we did one, I was, was it the Archaeology of the Climate Change Conundrum? Mm. And that was myself, Neil Radfern from CBA, Rachel Bino from Southampton University and Hannah Fluck from Historic England, um, led by uh, Derek and Lawrence from Career and Ruins. And yeah, so that was a, a discussion piece on how archaeology and how archaeology has a, a, a place at the climate change table, debate table, and if it does at all. Um, and um, and my, my biggest thing on that was about... Um, if you if we don't make it really relevant to people, then it's just an interesting thing. Um, I don't know if a lot of people find when they go to say uh, an outreach event, or you're talking to the public and they go, "Oh, that's really interesting," or "Oh, that's quite intriguing," or "I didn't know that before." It's all very nice, but what it all it only hits is um, what's called um, I don't know if you know Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's a great big triangle like this and at the bottom of the triangle you've got uh, the basic needs so humans need to do things in a certain order and um so they first of all they need to eat they need shelter they need um warmth so those are the basics after that you need security after that you need friendship and after that you need self-interest and a lot of the work we do only ever really hit especially in this is not just this is not just citizen, but this is archaeology in general and also museums and history groups and so on. We, we often, all our outreach and all our work and our work with volunteers just hits the, the top needs, those self-interest needs to maybe improve oneself or maybe make new friends or, or do those kind of things. But, for, uh, but climate change is actually something that affects human basic needs. And so archaeology really needs to drill down to that message of basic needs in order to demonstrate that um, it is important as a, a, as a, a topic for climate change debate or it's a, it's a useful tool to use in the climate change debate. Um, I went to um, Hall Sands uh, yesterday to demonstrate this by showing um, a, a village that basically <clears throat> it got washed into the sea. Um, it's to do with old uh, some dredging from the late 1890s. Um, the dredging cleared the beach and then after a couple of hefty storms the entire village went into the sea. Um, behind the village there's more buildings that will eventually also go into the sea. Now if I say to someone this, uh, this cliff is, um, is falling away at 30 centimetres a year and we know this from the archaeological record you know the stuff that Oliver just showed you on the, on the screen there um, how much a coast can change if, if you demonstrate that and it's just a, a grassy ledge, a nice big grassy field that just drops into the sea and, and you say 30 centimetres a year, it doesn't really have much meaning to people. It's like, oh, okay, that's really interesting. Let's survey it. Hmm. And then they go home. But if you say it's 30 centimetres a year and you put a house just behind it, then you've got something really measurable. Or if you've got one of those churches that is just about to fall off a cliff or an old castle that's halfway falling down a cliff, you've got something that's measurable to a human being. And when a human sees that, then it relates to their basic needs of food and shelter and warmth and be able to live and security. And if you can drill down to that level in people's understanding, and then you can say, well, because if we know this and we know it's changing, we know that your house is going to get it in about 50 years time then it means something. Mm. And so what's great about what we do is, is we can actually add value to a climate change debate and have a discussion at the climate change table um, using what we find in maritime archeology span and in particularly coastal archeology span and the whole debate on our podcast. Um, my bit was, was mainly around that. Rachel Bynum was looking at prehistoric, like really old climate change. We're talking thousands of years old um, out, in, out in the North Sea, that, that's her bit. And, and Neil and, um, uh, Hannah talking about today and legislation and what we can do um, but I'm hoping that Citizen is in a really really good position to be able to demonstrate the here and now and what's going to be happening through what, what we've what our volunteers and what our teams have surveyed from past environments and the evidence that we have of how how things have changed and just to demonstrate you know we're, it's changing and we'll adapt and we'll move back and it'll be fine so we're not predictors of doom and gloom <laughs> but we are certainly people that I think should be at the climate change debate table. You're right, because coastal intertidal archaeology, they're great case studies that showed literally what is happening, especially with the Citizen app and your website and what you guys are doing. You're recording something happening in one area and you're documenting it, how it changes. So 
yeah, you, you're right. You do deserve a table. <laughs> you deserve a seat at the table. There you go. <laughs> we have um, a few questions on YouTube and one of them, ooh, which to start with? Okay, we'll start with Alex. So Alex was asking, um, of course, it's, it's very interesting what you're all speaking about. Thank you, Alex. Um, he was asking, what type of equipment are you using to survey and document archaeological finds along the coast? Uh, I can go for this one if it's, okay. it's easier. So um, it's changed. The whole thing's changed. So the whole kind of, um, the beauty of modern technology is we, the days where you used to spend weeks recording sites with tape measures and various other stuff is kind of, it's not gone, but it's kind of moved, moved sideways. So essentially we use a lot of RTKs, so fi very fancy GPS, millimeter accurate GPS. Um, I personally use a lot of 3D modeling, so a lot of photogrammetry. So of course, the 3D modeling with intertidal stuff, you've got to remember it's a tidal thing. So that site might look completely different six in six hours time. Uh, and that's something that's weird, is very key. So photogrammetry, although its accuracy can be questioned at different times, it allows you to rapidly record a site. And when that site will change, in another, you can guarantee there will be a change to that site in another six hours, uh, photogrammetry has become very important. Of course, we do use the standard tape measures, a lot of measured sketches as well, and then a lot of research in the background, which is where the armchair archaeology stuff came in of using volunteers to do some of the post ex work as well and kind of the research that leads up to the actual surveys that we kind of we had to be involved in in the past but not as not on as big a level as we did until isolation where we could give them those tasks to do but yeah so a lot of rtk stuff um it's all moved digital so a lot of gis stuff um just kind of planning those spatial relationships uh drones obviously a lot of aerial photographs i love the fact that we're now you don't have to schedule a, pl a plane to go over your site you can now <laughs> You can now just chuck a drone up from your hand and it'll, and it'll if you plotted it in right, without for making it fly into a cliff, which did happen to me once, um, it will it will record it quite nicely. But yeah, so I use, personally, I use a lot of RTK drone work and it's moved. And then of course, what I've realized in isolation and prior to isolation is from that, you can generate content from the, the drones record video, the drones record these it's really difficult to take a photo with a drone that looks bad, is what I've discovered. I've, I challenge someone to actually take a photo using a drone where it looks terrible. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so it's that kind of thing of, for me, going forwards out of isolation, it will be this idea of making sure that quality content as well as very good quality survey data comes out of what we do going forwards. I don't know if anyone else has, Ollie does a lot of other recording of a very different type of archaeology to be honest. I do a lot of ships as opposed to Ollie who does a lot of prehistory stuff. Well, yeah, I mean, it's the same kit that we have along. I mean, yeah, as, as Grant was saying uh, much earlier on, we're limited by tidal windows, of course, and they chop and change whereabouts you are. So some of the sites that we work on are really at the extent of the, the mud flats when the low tides are at, the, are at their lowest. So we're almost two kilometers offshore in some places. And that gives us more 20, 30 minutes of a site being exposed to meaningfully record it in a way that um, is useful for us, whether or not to, we need to return to it, you know, to get a really good snapshot of it. So the RTK equipment, the, the rapid survey equipment has been really vital because we only picked those up um, sort of 18 months ago. So they've been quite a game changer for us in terms of the level of detail that we're able to capture now. Um, we were, yeah, as Grant was saying, flying a lot of drone surveys and trying to eye features in looking at the screens, which is doable to a certain extent, but it needs to be ground truth. Um, and, cru and crucially as well with the, the information we're after with the, with the RTKs, we get the Z data. So we get our height data on levels and they are really crucial to understanding is the archaeology we're looking at it was it terrestrial um or has it always been intertidal you know it's it's the vital part of the picture that we need to build up so that that kit is essential for the work we do and are you ever excavating anything or is it all just recording just recording the sea excavates everything for us to so no we <laughs> no <digging. laughs> If we're, well, takes, it's for so, us. <laughs> yeah, it does the job for us. It's quite, I haven't had, yeah, it takes a lot of uh, sediment out and reveals stuff all the time. So it's quite nice. But that's what I mean by it. it's such a dynamic environment. We don't really think about that your site changes every time. Every site, time I go back to a site, something about it will have changed, if that makes sense. Mm. Oh, I like it. It's even more interesting in a way because it's not intrusive. 
but I'm used to obviously the intrusive stuff. So definitely a different way. It's very interesting. And that kind of must your question, Alex. So sorry, I didn't, I just saw it now. Um, that's YouTube. I'm talking to YouTube guys. Okay, uh, we have another question. Uh, dum, dum, dum. Okay, um, what's the most interesting thing that you have found along the coast in your archaeological experience? That's a big question. No pressure. <laughs> what's your most oh, favorite? Sorry, you guys need to think a bit more. <laughs> <laughs> Oliver can go first. Yeah, go. Oliver's got the most famous one. Um, it's uh, the most interesting thing that I found is, is really it's what our volunteers found again. It's on the oystermen on Mersey Island. They found um, the remains of a Bronze Age trackway, which is a, a hugely amazing uh, thing that got um, uncovered uh, by the seas. Um, it's, yeah, it's basically dated to 952 AD, and it was three huge oak planks, timber planks that had been worked. Um, they had tool marks all over them, they were beautifully socketed, they were laid on top of a brushwood raft set in the middle of a channel, again well over a kilometre offshore. So to be that far away from the shoreline, away from land and to find um, and have the opportunity to kind of record and lift these amazing timbers um, with the help of Historic England, thank you, um, who have also been um, doing some conservation works, preservation works, sorry, on those timbers and we're going to return those back to Mersey Island Museum and they're going to be displayed for the locals to um, enjoy and for anyone else to go and see and get an idea of the type of archaeology that the Blackwater and the Colne Estuary is, is offering up. So that was pretty special. It's a huge thing. It's very interesting to see. I just found something randomly on Google as you were saying it. So is this thing here? That's the one, yeah. That, well, there we go. So yeah. That's the section there. So there, there were two other pieces that were also found. Um, and if, if they were all related, which it may well be, um, the structure itself probably around 50 metres long. So we're looking at a, a huge timber trackway resting on brushwood uh, that had been put down to sort of protect, to stop the timbers falling into what effectively was marshy ground. We did some um, auger surveys and there, some environmental surveys and discovered that it, it really was um, sort of infrequently flooding marshland. So not a million miles dissimilar to a large kind of uh, salt marsh area. Um, and this had obviously been constructed to, to span some gaps, maybe some small islands that are offshore. We know that there are quite a few bits of submerged woodland. We have quite a lot of large tree trunks that pop up all around those bits of uh, the southern foreshore of Mersey Island. So yeah, I mean, you can see they're absolutely ginormous things. So the waves were lapping around everyone's ankles by the time we'd finally lifted those off. And we were very fortunate to have a, access to a boat. So they were sailed off around the island by some of our local volunteers, which was a fitting finish. We all have to swim back. <laughs> I thought your mammoth tusk was also a biggie. Well, that's, what, that's what I was thinking, the mammoth tusk, because that's, that's cool. That's yeah. our favourite find from your site. Yeah, my favourite was the mammoth tusk. <laughs> I, just, I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to take away from you guys. <laughs> if you want to do that one, that's fine. <laughs> I'm looking for it. Let's see if I can find a picture of it. There's a 3D model on Sketchfab of the Mammoth Tusk yeah. and the trackway, I believe. Uh, yeah, the Mammoth Tusk was quite a, quite an interesting find. That was, but basically there's a, again, group of volunteers doing a, just a big uh, foreshore survey, just a walkover survey, just to get an, an idea of what there was. Um, and again, this was very, very far on the, on the low tide line. And it was just a little cone, they described it as, just sticking up out of the foreshore. Uh, and there was a group of three of them and one of them sort of said, oh, I've seen something like that before. That looks a little bit like sort of bone kind of thing. Um, so they just, yeah, they just cleared away the top surface of the of what was above it and there you have it an absolutely beautiful almost intact two meter long tusk of a woolly mammoth two meters yeah there's a terrible picture of me laying down next to it looking like an idiot pointing at it which really gives it a scale um hopefully we'll be able to find that tash i think i managed to take <laughs> oh, it out uh, everywhere lucky I'm it's, on, the screen it's on the instagram ollie oh is it great that's <laughs> yeah, great. At the bottom. right at the bottom just to just to let you know. <laughs> I'll find it later. <laughs> Don't feel like you need to. <laughs> that is amazing. Guys, they found a mammoth tusk. Wow. Yeah, so it's, it, 
it's always a surprise being out there because we have all of this archaeology from across multiple periods. So we have a lot of Roman archaeology, we have a lot of prehistoric Bronze Age, Iron Age human remains are starting to, to kind of come up. And then we've got sort of mid to late medieval um, structures to the eastern end of the islands. And we have these huge, incredible Saxon fish traps. So the structure that we looked at earlier on that slide, the really long kind of narrow slender V-shaped um, structure, again, it, that may well be a new one of these. There are eight that are known in the Blackwater that are all dated to around 750 to 900 AD and they're huge, um, basically fishing structures. So they would have nets at one end of these huge V-shaped arms, leaders they're called, and the fish would basically be drawn down them when the tide is running out so they wouldn't be able to swim out of the arms and they simply get caught in these traps. So we have lots of evidence for this cropping up all over the Blackwater, which is quite interesting because they're huge yield structures. Some of them are two, three, four hundred meters long, some of these things. So there's an awful lot of fish being caught in the Blackwater in between the eighth and ninth centuries. So it's kind of trying to get a handle on just how much there was because, um, yeah, there's plenty of evidence for it. Fascinating. Is, Grant, is anything from that's on Sketchfab that you'd like to talk about? I can open it for you. I don't think it's on Sketchfab, but in, on because we only so. The South Devon Rivers Discovery Programme is a little bit newer. Ollie was working in 2015 to 2018, so we had a little bit more time to play. But in South Devon Rivers, it's actually not so much a find, but a whole vessel that had a very unique history that took on more, more relevance due to the current situation. Because it's so there's, it's a fever hulk. So it's an isolation hospital ship for um, when, the, when people were coming into Dartmouth Harbour and showing signs of contagious diseases. Uh, they would dump them on the ship called the Mayfly, which was a paddle steamer, uh, which at the time was moored up near the ferry, if you've ever been down near Kingsbridge, and en eventually seems to end up in Old Mill Creek, and it would appear that the vessel is still there. And then that ties in amazingly to the Kingsway Castle, which is near my house, um, which is the one that was the replacement isolation hospital ship. So I, I just, that one took on a more, a more, a bigger relevance due to the current situation of how we how we dealt with pandemics in the past and how we would isolate for yellow fever and Spanish influenza and things and people coming in from other areas with contagious disease. But yeah, that's, that would be my most interesting one as part of this job. And Caroline, anything to add? Or shall I ask so, well, I don't really get um, sites. So I, I, I get the glory of enjoying everybody's sights. <laughs> um, so, but for a brief moment, I was the Solent Harbour's Discovery Project Officer for just about four months for Citizen. And, and previous to Citizen, I, I'd worked in um, um, boat, traditional wooden boat building and also in maritime archaeology and before that at Stonehenge Landscape. So my areas of, of expertise and things that I like were really around to do the was around the Neolithic and Bronze Age, and actually a bit of Mesolithic as well. So I really liked my flint and my worked flint. And then I also liked uh, traditional wooden boat building construction. Um, but I've got this weird thing now. I quite like concrete. There's something about it. I don't know why. And there are other members of our team that will go, yes, go girl. And so, <laughs> but now um, it, it's, it's various influences, um, um, that have come around me and now I'm, I'm walking along going, oh, that's World War II concrete down there. Wow, that's interesting. <laughs> so I have a weird interest in concrete, uh, World War II concrete and embarkation hards along the South Coast that I never had before. Um, and the most, I think that the, the loveliest thing was to see, um, it's not actually my discovery. It was when um, myself and Grant were out at Leap and at Leap there's some embarkation hards and um, some, um, on, for these embarkation hards, you know, to get your landing craft um, to the, the, the platform, you had something called chocolate blocks and they're pieces of um, concrete that actually do look in the shape of chocolate blocks. So they've got these little blocky sections in them. And uh, we took a, a group out to, to look and, and do, do, basically do a tour. And um, when the kids, most of them, there was a family, there's lots of little girls, they're all about the age of eight years old and so on. We did our walk and then we came back. And as we came back, they came running up the beach. I found a chocolate block. Yeah. And they got so excited and they knew, they'll, they'll come away from that. And for the rest of their lives, they'll know exactly what that concrete thing in, on the beach is 
what it's called and the fact that they found it because when we walked back they kept on pointing them out and finding different ones and it was it's something that I, I never thought I'd like but the passion that those girls showed in finding chocolate block concrete is actually what is inside me but I just don't shout about it as loudly um but yeah that, that weird thing that I like now <laughs> it'll pass hopefully <laughs> it is infectious. The love of concrete is infectious. And it is. It's one of our colleagues called uh, Chris Kalonka from the North who loves concrete. Like he'll do a good five hour talk on concrete, but his passion is there and you kind of with him. For the whole, so despite concrete, as soon as someone says concrete and archaeology kind of just get a bit, <laughs> we all make the same face. <laughs> but then when you're with him, the passion he has for it and the understanding he has for it, and then you just start seeing it everywhere. And then once that information's in your head, it becomes a kind of challenge. It's like a lovely challenge to find chocolate blocks and LCT repair stations and first world war concrete, second world war concrete. Oh, it's, yeah, it's infectious. If you ever meet Chris, you'll love him, Tash. You'll, you'll love the man. <laughs> Maybe I need to chat to him to see if I can get enthused about concrete with you guys. Maybe, who knows? Yeah. Yes, he will yeah. say yes to that, Tash. I'll answer yeah. him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we have um, a few more questions. Anyone who's viewing, we have um, a little bit of time left, so get your questions in. Um, there's somebody's asking a question. Hello, Delby. They're asking, oh, lucky them. They're going to be going to Jurassic Coast over the next few days, and they're wondering if you have any advice for any nice spots. Yes, but it depends on uh, if she's looking at archaeology or do dinosaurs. Is she an archaeologist, but got a secret paleontologist inside her? Well, a ten year old <laughs> daughter, so probably both. A bit of both. I mean, they watch our, well, they watch our live streams every week, so probably both. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I've been going to uh, Jurassic Coast all my life. My parents have been taking me. We always have to stop. My grandparents so had a farm in Devon, and I live in Hampshire, so it was always sort of the halfway stop was Charmouth Bay, Lyme Regis. And actually, um, so if you, I've been, I watch it on Google Maps when there's a good landslide at Charmouth Bay, you know, there's some good stuff you're going to get out of there. But um, there's a, a guy I follow actually on Instagram and he goes out all the time around Charmouth Bay. And I think he owns the little shop underneath the museum at Charmouth Bay. And um, you can get some really good ammonites and bellamites out on that section. Um, it's also where the Victorian bottle dump is and there's a slump in the, in the, in the side at Golden Cap. And so you might find some Victorian bits and pieces as well. And all Victorian bottles are, are sometimes really, really lovely things. Um, but don't go to Lime Regis, because Lime Regis on that beach, that's all imported pebbles. That beach is not natural. Um, so the Lime Regis, um, the, their problem with uh, coastal change is actually due to rainfall. And the more rainfall you get, uh, the more the coast is getting pushed out and then it tumbles down the cliff and goes out to try and um, shore up that. They've put certain co concrete defences around, but also um, the, the beach has actually been washed out so much that it was replaced. So a lot of what you see on that beach is actually French shingle. It's not not local sand for local people no this is french shingle so don't go to lime regis for fossil hunting that's good for your fish and chips it's great for the tourist shops but it's not actually a good fossil hunting place you should go to charmouth bay next door and there's a lovely walk you can do it along the beach and if the tide comes in you can actually do it over the cliff as well but there's a lovely beach but there's a walk between the two but actually at charmouth bay they've got the dinosaur museum there run by volunteers which is a lovely thing lovely way to, to to find out about what's in the area um, and they do fossil walks I don't quite know if they're doing it at the moment I think they are but they do fossil walks so you have a, a paleontologist guide who will take you out in groups I think twice a day and um, he'll he'll show you what to do or you can just hire your own little little hammer and um, <laughs> and just go off by yourself and um, I recommend going if you're facing the sea you go to your right and go down that side it's more rocky um, it's where the biggest landslides have been recent in recent years and also it's where um, again a bit like with our coastal archaeology god washes our artifacts for us and he finds them so all you have to do is look around in the little rock pools so you go around into little rock pools you pick up you just pick up handfuls or you sieve it if you've got a sieve and the, the Anamites and the Bellamites will, will come out. And there's a few other um, things that will come out as well, like old uh, um, sea urchins will come out and you'll eventually 
if you are lucky, you'll get an ichthyosaur piece, uh, ichthyosaur vertebrae. That that will be the prize thing. That's that's the cool stuff to get. It'll be very very dark, almost black rock, and it'll look like a little a little sweetie, but it'll be an ichthyosaur vertebrae, and that that will be the that will be uber cool points if you can get one of them. <laughs> I'm curious, like you know, like for example, mudlarkers in London Thames, they need to get a license. So how does it work for the coast there? So they don't need a license. You can just go with, as you said, with a little hammer. It doesn't really matter. Uh, paleontology and archaeology are, are two completely different things in terms of the legalities of what you can do and what you can get. Um, and I often find with archaeology, you know, you're, you're even on land archaeology. I've been at sites before you've excavated down to the natural level and then all, with all these imprints of animites and archaeologists don't do anything. The deer comes through and destroys the lot. If they can be bothered to find a paleontologist, they will. But the the legislation to protect paleontologists' interests compared to archaeologists' interests of, is very, very different. But I'll let the other two answer as well, because I've been talking a lot. <laughs> I mean, we're not, we're not strictly, we're not a fine space project. We're really, as we said earlier, we're purely about recording structures in a non-invasive way. So we would say um, if folks are going to go down to the foreshore, and it's very likely that you might find something that they just record that and report that to the, the PAS, the Portable Antiquities Scheme, if that's something that um, they take away with them, which we, we don't do that as part of the project. Um, and also just don't go to private property. Big one. Yeah, be aware of the platform. But stick it on the app. Context is everything. So if you get a location for it, stick it on the app and then we'll know that at least it existed. I think there's a lot of things, a lot of things that I forgot is uh, context when it comes to finds that just turn up in foreshores. People take them without realizing that the context is probably very important. So it may seem like just one Roman piece of pottery or something like that, but when you put it all together and you find out 200 pieces have turned up from the same bit of beach for the last. 20 years suddenly you're able to say there's probably a site somewhere nearby that so yeah if you if you do come across it report to the portable antiquity scheme and of course stick it on the app so that we know it existed the information will probably get around to us eventually but just to make it a bit smoother so it's so true what you said there actually about like imagine if yeah if they found 200 pieces of pot roman pottery yeah, it seems, it seems yeah. innocent if that makes sense kind of seems an innocent thing to find but then if you find hundreds of hundreds in the same location over the course of a year. It means that something very different is going on there. Hmm. So you have, and you have the portable antiquity scheme um, that you can, that can help, but also the, uh, because we're on the beach and we're, you might be f finding stuff under high tide, then it's also the um, receiver of wreck. There's yeah. another person who also needs to know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we will be doing a live stream with uh, PSA soon you schedule a date so you'll be able to find out more from them and i'll put the link as well in this in the description <laughs> some interesting comments coming through somebody's asking uh mudlarking is very popular don't you just hate them a little bit <laughs> i don't i love them. <laughs> i love i love anyone who takes an interest in the sea mm. and anyone who cares passion i love i love passion and, and the actual i hate boring people if you haven't got a passion, if that makes sense, I enjoy that the mudlarkers have a passion. Sometimes, like metal detectors, sometimes it can be misdirected and could do with being changed in certain areas. But as a general group, they love the foreshore. They have a connection with the river, the estuaries, the coast. And I enjoy that. I enjoy anyone who has a passion for what they do. And I think that's a good thing, if that makes sense. Sometimes I do get... When they find nice stuff, and I've, I remember one... Someone brought me a full clay tobacco pipe. You've worked in commercial archaeology. I've never managed to find a clay, full clay tobacco pipe. I've always found bits of them, but I've never found the full whacker. Basically, it just does annoy me that they keep finding them so, so regularly, and I've never found one complete. I always find very, very dateable material. It seems to be my, my thing. I never find fancy things. I just find very useful things. I do find really nice stuff. You are right, especially on Instagram. Oh my goodness, they make it look so arty as well. <laughs> it is lovely to look at, actually, their photos, generally speaking. And of course, yeah, a bit gel sometimes, but you get the nice stuff. They really do. Yeah. There's no context, so for us, it's a bit, hmm. Um, let's see, we'll answer one more question. 
because we are coming up to 6.20. Let's see. Dum, dum, dum. Ah, okay, from Angelina. Hey, Angelina. Are volunteers also trying to keep the places clean and watch over them to protect them? Uh, cleaners in terms of beach cleans. So we I have been... In the sense of beach cleaning, yeah. Yeah, so I personally work off a kind of trying to keep it pristine and you will often, if I do a recce, you will often find me with a gigantic bag full of rubbish. Because often, as we all know, plastic pollution is a big problem. So we're, when we're going to foreshores, particularly in areas where not many people go, um, you'll find plastic everywhere. So I tend to try and clean up as I go. But um, general rule when it comes to volunteers is leave it, leave it as pristine as when we found it. So if you take anything with you, ensure that comes back with you so we're not contributing to the problem. Um, yeah, that's about it. Anything to add, Oliver? I, I mean, our volunteers, just, they do a great job of keeping an eye out on the site. So, I mean, we don't really have too much of an issue with, I guess, traditional beach cleaning because they're not necessarily anywhere near the beach. So they're quite rarely visited. So, um, yeah, they do a great job of keeping an eye on the important things um, because they've you know, been through a lot of sessions with us and they know what to look out for now. And I suppose now would be a great time to say that we're going to have a new field guide coming out so that other people can keep an eye out and then know what to look for. So we're just finishing off that. It's being produced. It's going to be a lovely little short guide for people to take out on the foreshore that will tell them what to look for, where to look for it, how to record it, and the important details that they need to capture to kind of to get the best possible picture and send on to us. That was neatly segued in as a little uh, plug, wasn't it? Yeah, that was beautifully done. That wasn't either. So for, um, we will be looking to work with volunteers in other sectors. So, for example, if you have RSPB volunteers who are out surveying the local bird life, if you have um, a wildlife trust volunteer surveying the local butterflies around the area, um, the idea of we've got a, a what's called a responsible coastal stewardship, which we'll be rolling out next year, we'll be working with those volunteers. So. Um, that there are lots of volunteers with lots of different groups all working in the same site. And what would be ideal is if um, if, if you've got somebody who's, who's surveying um, the oysters, uh, the, the invasive Japanese oysters that are on, that so happen to be on our wrecks, on our hulks, then they can record the hulk at the same time. Uh, and vice versa, if we've got a start, we've got volunteers and they're doing something and uh, I don't know, the lesser spotted bush cricket, I can't think of an animal right now, <laughs> might be around the area, then our volunteers could, could survey that at the same time as we're looking at our fish traps. Um, so there should be, and hopefully there'll be a lot more cross collaboration going on with the thin third year of our project. And this, I hope, will also include beach cleaners. There are people going out there and looking at stuff and cleaning the beaches. And sometimes I think it will be almost like a watching brief. It will be great if an archaeologist um, or one of our team members was out there at the same time. Because um, sometimes beach cleaners can pick up things and they actually realise, yes, it is a rubbish, but it's Victorian bottle rubbish, not modern coke can bottle rubbish yeah it's just actually d defining what is what is rubbish to be preserved and go wow and what is rubbish to go uh, and put it in a bin and chuck it um but in an ideal world if we can work with those kind of groups that are already out on the beach doing stuff and we'll be adding to their their knowledge and interest as well as 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 we're all looking after and caring for our beaches uh, but yes that'll be the the responsible coastal stewardship program which will be our, our next year project and I would just like to share this for our viewers. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. That's it's, not a, it's not a great photo, but it is a beauty. Hey, that, you, you can't that see the right mammoth there, tooth. Look at that. Mm. I mean, that's what you want. I'll make sure when I find, if I ever find a mammoth tusk, I'll make sure to recreate that. Yeah. I think we should just try to, yeah, this is a challenge. For anyone going onto the beach and you find something, You've got to take that pose. You've okay, got you've got a tag. Exactly. But you've that actually got to put shock. the artifact in the pose as well, because I couldn't actually see the mammoth tooth. <laughs> the mammoth tooth, so I can only see you. <laughs> yeah. You know, I do remember looking through and seeing how many pictures we have of just people pointing at stuff. The level of pointing in our Instagram is quite extreme. Just people <laughs> pointing, at, pointing at structures, pointing at this, pointing at that. It seems to be our creating pose. <laughs> I'm a little worried that you're just going to set off loads of people saying there's pictures of them laying next to giant horns on the beach now. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> might not go as well as we wanted to. <laughs> yeah, <it> might not. <laughs> so then we could just Thank photoshop you. something. Yeah, I'll entertain this for a bit. Yeah. Well, I think maybe because we now just maybe shamed Oliver a little bit, we'll show something a bit nicer of Oliver. And for our viewers at home, you may recognise this chap from. Dun, dun, dun. Off the TV. <laughs> yes. What's this? Our shorelines are littered with amazing remnants of the past. 18th century refrigeration technology and history waiting to be discovered. It's the remains of a destroyed city. Tori Herridge and Alex Lanlands meet Britain's leading coastal archaeologists to find mysteries waiting to be solved. It's the smell of learning to read. <laughs> Look at that, that's incredible. It sounds like architecture is beautiful, actually. It's an essential part of our coastal heritage. A brand new series, Britain at Low Tide, Saturday at 8 on Channel 4. Just one second. What is going on with you in this uh, scale? Just prodding about. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was incredibly slippery just there, and I nearly went on my bum <laughs> twice. So that is a walking aid. <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't use ranging poles for; they're very, you know, easy to break. But... They, they do make great walking sticks. I just kind of look, you just look like Gandalf for the foreshore when you've got it wandering across the mud <laughs> 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 Oh, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you all today. Do you have anything else to add before we go? No? Thank you, Aspect. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, sorry for the sorry for if anyone did hear the early chatter in the live. Sorry for all the way. <laughs> sorry know. for that. Uh, yeah. Well, no, it's lovely. It's definitely made history, hasn't it? That's made that's made my archaeologist in quarantine history right there. But <laughs> all fun and games. Um, Oh, just before we go, simple archaeology, we did already speak about health and safety, uh, working on the coastal and intertidal, and I'll send you the direct link for that. So I think we've answered everybody's questions. Again, thank you all so much for joining me this evening. I have to check the time there. <laughs> Sorry. And again, um, I'll put all the links in the description. And if you, the viewers at home, have any questions for our panel, please put them in the um, comment section and I'm sure we can get back to you maybe for a little Q&A or we can direct you to them directly that didn't make any sense you guys know what I mean okay it's time to go oh, what's this yes it's time to go guys it's been an absolute pleasure goodbye YouTube thank, thank you, you. Bye. bye and we are adios bye. 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 Yes. are you still live